Hello and welcome to Talk Wildlife and today I'm going to be talking about the BTO's new bird trends report. Um, I've got with me Rob Robinson who's the Associate Director for Research at the BTO. Hi Rob, how are you? Hi, I'm very well, I'm delighted to be here. I bet you are, I bet you as delighted as you were the first time I started this interview and forgot to press record. But at least this time it's recording and I am now taking full responsibility for the fact that I forgot to press record. Right, so what we're gonna do is I just wanna talk about the Bird Trends Report. And to set the scene, what I wanna do is just talk a little bit about uh, where the data comes from for the reports. So to start off, Rob, if you could just give us um, a little bit of background, how, how long ago did Bird Trends start? So Bertrand started in the mid 1990s. Originally, it was a paper publication, um, and I still have those uh, those those books um, sitting sitting on my shelf um, around the corner there, gathering dust. Because of course, the one thing with a paper publication is once it's printed, you can't change it. Um, the nice thing uh, about the web is that it allows the uh, things to be continually updated. So this is a report that's been updated annually every year since the early 2000s. And it's really a short window on the um, work that BTO and all its volunteers um, do in terms of uh, providing information and evidence for the health of Britain's bird populations. Right, and it, it's not just, so it's not the bird trends report and it's, it's one piece of citizen science that feeds into that. It's multiple uh, projects that you guys manage through citizen science that feed into this data, isn't that right? Absolutely, it draws from the, uh, a wide range of surveys that we do. So um, a core part of it is um, results from the Breeding Bird Survey where our volunteers uh, go out every year, currently about 4,000 of them, go out every year and sort of count birds um, in sort of uh, their local uh, patch, if you like, uh, which tells us, uh, tells us about the numbers of birds that uh, we are seeing in the UK. Um, but it also brings in information from the ringing scheme, um, which tells us about how well birds are surviving um, from year to year. And it draws in information from the nest record scheme. Uh, which tells us about um, how well um, birds are reproducing, so how many chicks they're um, fledging each year. And by bringing all of these things together, what we hope to do is to be able to get a sort of a much more rounded picture of not only how healthy our bird populations are, but also what's causing some of the changes, um, uh, both up and down. And that's information that um, we can use, um, for instance, in sort of uh, designing effective conservation strategies. Right, and, and it's not just an English report, it's, it's obviously Wales, Scotland, it you know, covers the whole of the UK, doesn't it? Uh, very much so, it's, um, and results are sort of presented for each of the four individual countries, but also for regions um, within those countries, so particularly for England, you can, you can look at some uh, the results from London, say, or from the, the North West, and that's really important because actually we see different changes in different parts of the country. Um, so in Scotland, for instance, um, many of our birds that are feeding on insects tend to be doing um, better than they are in the south and the east. And what's the aims of the report? So, you know, what do you set out to do when you produce the report? Um, so the aim is very much is to make evidence available to people who want to use it. I mean, what we're trying to do is give um, as balanced a picture as possible as to the sort of uh, the health of our bird populations, as, as I said, but also some of the changes that are underlying that so that people can use that um, in their day to day decision making. Right. And, and by day to day decision making, we're talking about local councils and the government and various other organisations. Is that right? Absolutely. So it, uh, the bird trends report is used by a whole range of people. So um, site managers, so various of my RSPB colleagues, for instance, will be using uh, using information, sort of background to the sort of the local changes that they they are seeing. So are are their local reserves doing um, uh, doing better than you might expect from the regional context? Um, but equally, it's used by government um, agencies, so Natural England, uh, Nature Scots, Natural Resources Wales. Um, 
when they come to be thinking about policies and thinking about things like site designation, it can provide them with, with it provides them with a very valuable context in terms of what are the conservation priorities in their region at the minute. But the information also um, can be used by um, consultants, for instance, so that they can understand um, wh uh, whether the birds that they are seeing on particular sites are particularly important, and that might therefore have sort of consequences for um, development plans that are um, in place there. And you might want to think about the sorts of mitigation measures or the sort of compensation measures that you can um, put in place to um, uh, to uh, sort of um, improve the status of birds locally. Right, okay, and, and how many species are we talking about? So the, so the report covers around 120 species, and those are mostly the sort of the common species that you'll see in the gardens or when you go for walks on countryside. Um, but we also link through to, for instance, seabirds. Um, so the Seabird Monitoring Partnership um, gathers data on uh, our seabird populations around the coast of Britain, many of which are sort of important in an international context, not just in the British context. Um, so you can find the information um, from there, there too. What we're trying to do really is to provide as one stop, as one stop as short as possible um, so that people have, can have information at their fingertips. Just as a matter of interest, how many sort of species are on the British list as breeding species? Do you know? Um, so we have around 220 regular breeding species plus another maybe 10 or 15 um, that are perhaps more ir irregular. Of course, that's um, sort of increasing. So we, we, many of us in the South will particularly will know about the, um, the rapid spread of little egrets in the last um, 25 years. And going further back, collar dove. The first breeding of collar dove was in 1955 in Nor uh, uh, Norfolk, my home county at the minute. Um, so it is increasing all the time. Uh, uh, although uh, one has to balance that with a few losses. So things like Rhinek and Redback Shrike, which were once common across Southern Britain, have been, um, uh, have been lost as uh, uh, proper breeding species. Yeah, and you, you sort of alluded to some of the regional differences. What, what have you seen as sort of being some of the key species that are showing a sort of range change in their distribution? Um, so I think it's very much about the, the climate winners. Um, so things like um, nuthatch, um, for instance, which is increasing, um, incre um, increasing northwards um, as a child growing up in Edinburgh, uh, the sort of the suburbs of Edinburgh, nuthatch for me was a red letter bird. I would, uh, I, I would, uh, they only just had a toehold in Scotland, breeding at the Herschel, right on the, right on the Scottish borders there. Um, so I would have to travel some distance to go and see one, but um, now they're um, uh, relatively common as far north as Perth and uh, sort of advancing still further. So they're um, uh, breeding in the my local woods. And that's, a, that's been a real surprise when, when I've been going back in the last few years, sort of hearing their sort of very distinctive call and uh, sort of in a place where I wouldn't necessarily expect it. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's a good news story because it's a great bird and not touch. Um, the figures themselves. So you, you updated sort of the uh, conservation findings. So, you know, the status of these birds. And I know that um, you've, you had six species that moved from amber to red in the UK. But there's also one that's done a jump from green to red. And it probably won't come as much as of a surprise to some birders and, and some garden bird feeders that, that that's the green finch. Um, so numbers still remain worrying on that. So can you give us a little back, a bit of background to what's happening with the green finch? Certainly, although I should perhaps just um, make one thing quite clear is that we're currently in the process of um, putting together the sort of the new list of birds of conservation concern, the new red list, if you like. Um, and these figures um, that have been collected by BT volunteers will very much feed into that and very much provide the evidence for, um, uh, for those things. So um, it hasn't quite been decided yet, but I mean, Greenfinch obviously is, I think is a very clear case where um, a species that was once doing very well is now um, in dire straits. So from when the BBS started in 1994 through to, through to the mid, uh, mid 2000s, and um, green finches were doing very well because they were able to 
um, exploit um, all the food that people put out in gardens, initially, um, uh, initially peanuts, um, but more recently sunflower hearts, which they absolutely adore. Um, but in 2004, 2005, we started getting the first um, reports of um, a disease, which um, until then was sort of mostly a disease of pigeons actually, um, called trichomonosis. Um, it's known as France amongst bird, amongst bird collectors. Um, and greenfinch is seen particularly susceptible to this. So since 2005, actually their numbers have been in free fall. And we've, we've um, lost um, probably of the order of one and a half to two million greenfinches over that uh, time, which is an astonishing number. And particularly given that it's been a sort of a, really it's been a national, um, a national decline. What you tend to expect from diseases is that they, they pop up, they, um, uh, they're around for a year or two, but then gradually sort of birds become immune or resistant um, and the populations uh, sort of bounce back over a relatively short spell of time. But in greenfinches, it's been really unusual in the sense that every year we see, uh, we record a new low um, for the population. So as a result, it is now a bird that's sort of in serious trouble. Yeah, and I, I know I've read, and I'm sure a lot of people have, that it's down, to, or a lot of it's down to, um, you know, hygiene at bird feeders. Is that is that the only thing that's driving this disease, or is there something else? Well, I think the sort of the the mechanisms of spread are not very clear, but it's it's very it's very much bird to bird. Um, but obviously, a lot. Um, Sort of keeping bird tables clean and bird feeders clean is one is one really positive thing that we can uh, do, um, but also um, spreading them out a bit so you don't so you don't have concentrations of birds in one particular area. Moving and, mo and, and moving them around um, um, every couple every every couple of months, say, so that you don't get the build up of um, debris that um, uh, you might get sort of under. Uh, under feeders um, can all help. Right, and, and just want to touch on before we move on to sort of a few of the birds in some of the trends. Um, chaffinch, chaffinch numbers now are also sort of in sort of well free fall at the moment. Is that because of this, the same disease, or is there something else driving that? Well, that's a very interesting question, and actually one that we're um, we've. Um, we're literally working on as we speak. Um, and actually my next meeting um, after, af after this interview will be to sort of discuss some of the progress on that. So you're absolutely right. So certainly um, chaffinch is a bird that gets uh, trichomonosis, uh, um, though at a much level, uh, much lower level than greenfinches. Um, and actually chaffinches may have, may have been responsible for the spread um, of the disease through into Europe. Um, so we saw in 2007, 2008, um, the same strain of the disease was being picked up in uh, Sweden, not Norway, but Sweden. And that very much reflected the pattern of migration of chaffinches. Um, so what we think is that um, birds were picking up the disease, uh, were surviving or were asymptomatic, and then we're sort of migrating through to the breeding grounds and then sort of transmitting the disease there. And from there, it spread all the way around through Europe. So it's, um, it's not, just a, it's not just, just a British thing. And certainly subsequently, we've seen um, a drop off in chaffinch survival. It, it was delayed by a few years compared to the greenfinches. So it wasn't until sort of 2010, 2011. Um, so at the minute, we're sort of trying to look, um, bring together all of the data uh, that we collect to try and understand why that might be, whether that's due to disease or whether that's due to some other factors. So uh, we had some cold winters, for instance, in around 2009, 2010. Are they important in driving the, uh, in driving the decline? And it's not just chaffinches. Um, uh, Colored doves um, are also declining. We're a little bit less sure that that's down to, that's down to the disease. Um, we've also seen changes in breeding success, for instance, and that's one of the nice things about this report is it brings together all these different aspects 
um, of the bird's biology. Um, so that's sort of an open question, but also um, sparrow hawks. So sparrow hawks are taking um, taking green finches and chaffinches, the sort of the sort of garden birds. Uh, we know that birds of prey are susceptible to trichomonasis. So are recent declines in sparrow hawk numbers um, due to the disease? And that's one of the things that we will be um, trying to look at too. Um, I suspect what we'll find is that um, there um, might well be a multiple a multiple set of factors in the case of um, sparrow hawk. But greenfinch is relatively unusual in the sense that we can we can identify one factor that is almost all, is almost the only cause of the decline, if you like. Right. Okay. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about um, just a few of the species. I mean, clearly we can't talk about them all as much as I'd like to, but there will be a link to the bird trends page under the uh, under this video so people can go and have a look for themselves and I, I reckon you do it's because it's really really useful and really interesting um but i've chosen sort of some birds to talk about from two different angles number one is some of them that have declined during this reporting period and then others that have been successful and i've just chosen three of each because as i say I, I could and as well you know i could talk all day about this but i've chosen some that sort of people are familiar with but also might be quite surprised by so yeah the, the first bird i want to talk about and i've seen this myself i've seen a marked decline on our estate but it's definitely last year was probably the most visible uh, in the house martin so the house martin you know has declined can you give us a bit of a background and give us your thoughts on why it might have declined uh certainly um and again, I think there's probably um, probably a number of factors that are going on here. Um, one of the things about the house martin, of course, is that it's a migratory bird, so it's here for the summer months only. And in fact, actually, um, it spends most of its time in Africa. So in some ways, it's more of an African bird than a British bird, uh, though it's always a welcome, uh, a welcome sign of um, spring. Um, it's feeding on um, aerial insects, and the numbers of these have declined uh, markedly over time. So at least part of the cause is down to uh, a reduced food supply. And we do see regional differences, not just in the house martin, but also in many other of our sort of migrant birds that are feeding on insects, in the sense that they tend to be doing much better in the north and the west than they are in the south and the east. And that's um, partly down to climate. Um, sort of the south and the east is drier um, and getting increasing, increasingly so, especially in summer. And the reason that's important is that um, insects really like damp places for um, sort of lay, laying their eggs and their, and their development. So anybody um, who has visited Scotland will know that um, it has quite a wet climate, it rains quite a lot, um, but also that that um, uh, supports an awful lot of midges and sort of small insects, um, which whilst very um, annoying for us, are actually sort of an essential component of the food chain and sort of really do support um, uh, higher bird uh, populations. So there's been a so there's been a decline in, a, in the food supply, and that that seems to have, that seems to have differed re regionally, but also of course house martins are nesting on buildings and buildings are becoming um, much less bird friendly now than they, um, they used to be. People uh, for some reason take exception to birds nesting on the um, on their building, particularly, particularly if, there's, if they're sort of generating lots of droppings which can look and um, look, look tidy or give people concern for sort of um, health reasons. So I think there is also a question in terms of availability of um, nesting sites. So there's two or three different causes there that might be happening in Britain, but also we, we have to remember that there's an awful lot of environmental change going on in Africa. Um, these birds are feeding um, over the uh, aerial feeders again over the rainforest and one thing that we all hear about in the news is loss of uh, rainforest, particularly in Central Africa. Um, so the, the range available to these birds as they feed um, must be declining and that must have an impact on bird numbers uh, too, although it's um, 
obviously very difficult to quantify because sort of doing field work in sort of Central Africa is quite tricky for a number of reasons. Right, and is there anything, because uh, I mean, our estate, as I say, last year, especially because I was working from, well, I was, I was off, I was furloughed, I was at home. And the one thing I was keeping an eye on were the house martins. And I thought first they were just late and then realized that actually, you know, they, they were, they were down quite significantly. I, I would say anywhere between sort of 50 and 60% on our estate last year. So the, the attempted to build on our house a couple of times and then ignored it, which I wasn't very happy about. But is there anything anybody can do? You know, do these false nests that you can put up, do they work? Will they attract them? Um, they can do. Um, the other thing that um, people can do is make sure that they have sort of um, damp, muddy patches so that the birds have enough material to build um, their own nests. So sort of um, just, just, just little, little muddy puddles in the corner of the garden, uh, sort of sort of an open corner of the garden or along a sort of a, a driveway can be really helpful for, um, for these birds um, to sort of gather the mud that they need to build, build the nest. Um, last year was sort of relatively unusual and um, well, lots of people made the sort of the same observation that you have, that the birds were both late and um, came back in fewer numbers. And that seems to have been um, related to sort of an unusually cold spring in Europe that I think sort of delayed the, um, the sort of the migration um, northward. But it does sort of highlight the um, the fact that these birds can face troubles at sort of um, many points along their sort of their journey and anything that we can do to to help ease their their time when they are here um, is really quite important. And one of the, one of the bits of work that I've done actually on swifts, not on house martins, but I'm sure the same principles apply, is that if birds have a tough breeding season, then that can affect their um, ability to make the journey south and um, to survive uh, the winter um, in Africa. So anything that we can do to help birds whilst they're here is um, uh, really valuable and to be encouraged. Right, okay. and. So that's the house martin. The, the next bird that I chose as a familiar bird we've already talked about, but I have got a couple of questions. Um, so while we're on it, we'll just, um, we will talk about this. One of them is, you've clearly given us a really good insight into what's happening with green finches and their numbers. So my first question is, is this trend across the UK or are there particular patches where, you know, it's, it's, uh, the decline's a lot steeper? Um, I think there are two answers to that question. Um, one of which is yes, um, it's across the UK, but actually it's sort of a little bit more of a complicated picture because what tends to happen is that the, the de disease seems to spring up in a particular area and that causes greenfinches um, to virtually disappear actually. And we sort of have reports of um, people sort of saying that greenfinches have sort of vanished from there their local area. And I think um, when that happens, the, uh, the disease sort of obviously, um, obviously dies down a bit. The, um, uh, the transmission is mostly bird to bird. So exactly in the same way that the government is trying to sort of uh, minimize social contact um, for us, um, the same is true of the greenfinches and that when you have low densities, birds are much less likely to sort of fight and squabble and come into contact with each other. And that causes the population to enable it to recover a bit, so you get the, so you get these cycles of populations, if you like, where the sort of the disease hits, numbers uh, numbers go down for a few years, and then gradually then gradually they rec um, they recover, and th and that seems to sort of vary in different parts of the country at different uh, at different times. Right, and and how because you, you've mentioned it there, my second question actually you've partly answered. How easy or difficult would it be for a bird like a greenfinch if this disease was to go away tomorrow? How easy would it be to bounce back? I mean, you know, does the brood size determine that? You know, how easy would it be for them? Yeah, for these, uh, for these small birds, um, they have a, a great capacity to bounce back if they have um, perfect conditions. So um, a greenfinch will lay, have a clutch of sort of five or six eggs, I think. Um, it might lay two clutches a year, so that's 12 chicks that it can, uh, it can potentially raise. 
obviously a few um, a few of those will die during the uh, as they as they leave the nest and sort of try, uh, try and make sense of the world. Um, but that's sort of um, an enormous uh, potential to sort of bounce back, and we see that very much in the case of, case of things like the wren, for instance. Um, I don't know if any of your list, listeners are old enough to uh, remember back as far as the 1962-1963 winter, which was hit bird populations really hard. Um, it was a really severe winter. We haven't seen its like since. Um, but wren numbers plummeted for, um, to a fraction of what they were. But um, within four or five years, they, um, they had bounced back to where they were um, prior to that winter. So it's sort of um, inbuilt into these populations, if you like, and it very much in contrast to things like seabirds, um, which are much longer lived. So a greenfinch will live, or your average greenfinch will live maybe, maybe, maybe a couple of years. Um, an old greenfinch would be eight or nine years, whereas seabirds like um, fulmers and gannets, for instance, will live 40 or 50 years. In fact, in albatrosses, we've seen the, the oldest bird it, um, the oldest known wild bird, Wisdom, the albatross, um, is still going strong at 70 years, uh, which is fantastic. So for, the, um, um, for them, their sort of their capacity to reproduce is um, much lower. Um, so they'll produce one egg or two eggs, uh, and they might not produce those every year. Um, so they have a, a much sort of longer lead time, if you like, for populations to, for their population to bounce back because they can produce um, fewer chicks at a, at a time. Sure, sure, right. Um, and just one quick question before the, we leave the greenfinch. Clearly there'll have been a lot of research done and we have mentioned keeping feeders clean and all the rest of it. Um, do you know whether, I don't know whether this is even possible, whether a cure could be found for this that could then be sort of put out there or is that impossible and I'm just dreaming again? Um, in the nicest possible way? Um, I think that would be challenging. Um, I'm sh I don't know enough about captive birds. I suspect there is some, uh, I suspect there is some medication that you can give basically, um, basically anti antibiotics. Um, this is a small, um, a small, small sort of protozoan parasite. Um, but delivering that in a way that um, you could, um, at a large enough scale that you could, you, you, you could impact the sort of the national population it would be tricky. Um, I think people have tried putting out things like medicinal grit, so, so grit, so grit um, laced with, with, these, with antibiotics. Um, but I, I think the, the efficacy um, has been shown to be um, relatively small, so it doesn't it doesn't have much actual impact. So it's a nice idea, but I think um, uh, these birds have probably got to tough it out themselves. But we um, can do every everything we can to make that as easy, easy for them as possible. So doing things like keeping your um, your feeders clean, for instance. Sure. Right. So that's good. And you know, it wouldn't be a talk wildlife uh, talk about birds if I didn't put a wager in there. Um, so the lapwing. Um, I could have talked about the curlew, but I'm doing that as a, as a hopefully a separate interview uh, with one of your colleagues. So the lapwings on the decline, again, you know, what's driving that and is there anything we can do to reverse it? Yeah, so I'm, I'm very glad you managed to include wader. Waders are close to my heart and the, and the sort of the group of species that I do a lot of work on. And the lapwing case is actually really quite interesting. So the population declined, and if you have a look at the, the page on the, on the report, you'll see that um, the population decline was mostly in the late 1980s and uh, late 1990s, uh, early 1990s. And since then, um, the population has been sort of uh, more or less stable, but at a lower level than it was um, previously. And actually, I've looked into this um, quite a bit. And what drove the decline um, in, the, in the 1980s was actually um, weather related. So there was a series of cold, um, cold winters, um, which meant that birds um, survived less well because they were unable to find um, food. These are birds that are sort of feeding um, 
uh, in the sort of the very upper layers of the soil. And if there's a sort of a heavy frost or if there's ice, then the, the, their food is basically um, unreachable. Uh, they're not like the curly where they, uh, where they can sort of um, delve deeper into the um, um, deeper into the sort of the substrate. Um, so the, that very much drove that sort of short term decline over the late late 1980s. Since then, um, um, we've seen the sort of the, the survival of birds bounce straight back to where it was before. So around 80% of um, adult birds survive um, from year to year. Um, but we haven't seen um, the population um, increase in, in the, same, uh, the same way. Uh, so why is that? That's because um, of changes that are happening in the breeding grounds. So basically lapwing productivity now is very compromised. So we talked about wren and its ability to bounce back. Um, lapwings don't have that resilient. Basically um, the changes in the farmed landscape particularly mean that their um, productivity now is barely enough to sustain uh, a sort of a stable population, let alone an increasing one. Um, so although we can't do much about the weather, what we can do is um, implement um, sort of um, lapwing friendly measures um, in, in farmland, so providing them with the sort of a mix of habitats they need um uh sort of fencing off areas so that they can't be um uh, predated by foxes um, for instance sort of uh, a feature of waders is their ground nesting and they're very susceptible to sort of um, um predator uh, predator numbers so there's a number of things that we can do in the um uh, doing the on the breeding grounds if you like or in the breeding season and um, i know the rspb on some of their reserves around here have been very effective at sort of increasing numbers in particular areas, what we need is that experience to be sort of um, applied more widely. Yeah, and of course, if you manage the habitat for the, the lapwing, you're managing the habitat for the ground nesting birds as well, uh, because you know quite a few of the ground nesting uh, weirdos are in sort of sort of trouble. Um, so of course, that has a, a larger benefit than for just the lapwing. Absolutely, and um, very much um, if you manage the habitat, then the birds will come. And I think one of the one of the features that we've lost in the last um, sort of 40 to 50 years is the resilience of our landscape. So um, um, birds are now uh, now relying on particular uh, particular areas, they're re um, particularly reliant on nature reserves these days, whereas before they might have, um, they might have been able to spread um, through the sort of the countryside, sort of uh, on, uh, on sort of wider farmland. Um, they don't have that, um, uh, I'm going to say luxury anymore. They're sort of um, they're really constrained in what they're where they're able to breed and sort of how many chicks they're able um, to produce. And that's I think one of the um, one of the big take home messages for me of sort of reading through sort of um, some of the pages of this report is um, just how widespread the effects have been on our um, on our countryside. Yeah, yeah. Well, fingers crossed we might see some changes. So. We looked at a few of the birds that uh, sort of showed that we were in trouble in the report. I want to talk again now about some of the birds that we're seeing positive change for. And again, I've chosen some birds that are so you know people will recognise regardless of whether they walk out bird watching. And the first one, and you know, this is a marked change. You know, I've seen it myself. You know, just in the time I've been in Norfolk, and I've only been in Norfolk seven eight years. Um, but one of them on there is the buzzard. So what's driving its success? Yeah, so um, you and me both, I think. So I grew up in Edinburgh on the east coast of Scotland. And again, for me, buzzard was um, a bird that I wouldn't see growing up as a child. Now, when I go back to visit my parents, um, I can have three or four circling over the house, which is just amazing. And again, um, moving down to Norfolk sort of 20, 20 odd years ago, it was a bird that would be uh, would be a red letter bird, but now I see one every I see one almost every day. Um, and still get a and still get a sort of a little buzz of joy actually. Um, we talk about um, shifting baselines, so people um, judge their um, view of the health of the countryside in relation to the sort of the conditions that they grew up with. Um, 
So we're, we often talk about this in a sort of a negative sense, in the sense that um, people, um, uh, uh, people growing up today, children, young adults, um, didn't experience the numbers of birds that um, the likes of you or our parents might have experienced when they were growing up in the 1950s and 60s, uh, before many of the declines, um, uh, sort of um, many of the uh, declines, particularly in farmland birds, started. They they we just don't have that um, that that knowledge, but it works the other way too. So things like buzzards and red kites um, uh, we have a value sort of beyond, um, beyond themselves, if you like, because um, we value them more because we wouldn't have experienced them um, as children. Um, the next generation, of course, will um, um, hopefully um, take, them, um, um, and take them sort of more for granted. Well, I hope they don't take them for granted, but um, yeah. um, realize the, sort of the, um, uh, the strides that we've made. But sorry, that's a, that's a slightly different point. I do apologize. Um, so buzzards are sort of very much one of the one of the most marked changes, as, as, as you said, in the, the sort of the birds of fauna. And I think there are a couple um, of reasons um, for this. Uh, one of which is um, uh, very direct, and that's per and that's persecution. Um, these birds in the 1950s, 1950s and 60s would have been um, controlled for their perceived. Um, impact um, on sort of game estates, um, rightly or wrongly. Um, but also they would have been, uh, their productivity would have been hit by the use of organochlorine pesticides um, in the way that many raptors, or productivity of many raptors was um, uh, sort of um, substantially sort of compromised. Um, they were able to raise fewer ch chicks, but also things like myxomatosis. Um, so for the, um, I don't know if many people remember that um, that far back, but that was a disease that virtually wiped out rab rabbits in Britain in the, 19, in the 1950s. And rabbits are a sort of a major prey source um, for buzzards. Um, so they would have um, they would have struggled to find food, but uh, rabbit rabbit populations are now a bit more um, a bit more plentiful. Um, so they're able to find um, find that food. Um, but also things like um, people planting um, shelter belts. Um, um, in the east of um, Britain, providing um, providing nest sites. So some so all, some of these trees that are being planted um, do uh, do provide sort of nesting habitat. So I think for buzzard, it's sort of um, a combination of things are sort of going their way, if you like, and they're sort of riding high as a result. Right, right, okay. And then so the next bird is. I mean, we we've we've talked about finches and we've talked about. Sort of green finches and chaffinches, and you know the, the fact that their numbers are declining. Uh, here's a bird that is bucking the trend in finches and seems to be doing really, really well. Why the difference? Um, so I think it's partly down um, down to well, it actually, it must be it must be entirely down to disease susceptibility. So green uh, goldfinches were. Uh, very much in trouble, along with um, other farmland birds in the in the nineteen seventies. Uh, their numbers were going uh, down, um, but then people started putting um, this new food stuff out in their gardens called niger. So really, um, small seeds that um, suit uh, the goldfinch well. Um, the goldfinch took to that and. Um, was able to thrive um, as a result. So a lot of the a lot of the reason for the increase is simply that birds are putting out um, food in gardens that these birds are eating, and also the um, the population has uh, sort of realised, if you like, or is coming to rely on these sort of uh, discovering these sort of garden uh, uh, gardens as a source of uh, food. Um, I think a sort of another um, contributory factor is likely to be climate change. So we don't have the cold um, winters that we used to have to any, anywhere like the same extent. So that um, birds are able to um, uh, survive the winter better. They're not, um, they're not faced with these uh, cold winters. And goldfinches actually also are um, a bit more of a Mediterranean species than the, the greenfinch. They're sort of adapted to sort of slightly higher temperatures. 
So in the summer, I think they've um, they've done better than greenfinches out of the sort of the warmer summers that uh, we've had. That sort of helped their uh, their productivity. Right. Okay. Um, quick question for you, uh, because I've had this debate with numbers of people. You mentioned Niger seed. How come? And you might not have seen this, but as I say, I've had a debate with quite a few people about it because my garden's the same. If I put Niger seed out, they hardly touch it. But if I put sunflower hearts out, they run it all the time. And I, I don't know whether you, you, you probably won't have a question, uh, an answer to this question, but I'm asking it anyway. Why are they showing a preference in some gardens to the sunflower hearts and ignoring the Niger seed? Because like you said, putting Niger seed out, well, what bought this bird sort of, you know, brought the numbers up, but all of a sudden they seem to have changed their diet. Do you know why yeah. that is? Um, and I, I, I think it's um, the explanation probably comes um, as much from the patterns of bird feeding them as the bird food themselves. So the use of sunflower hearts actually is a relatively recent, um, a relatively recent phenomenon. Um, people um, certainly, as a kid, I used to put out whole black sunflower seeds, and green finches can't cope with them. So if they're given a choice between whole black sunflower seeds and Niger, they will take the Niger because um, they're much able to, much, much easier able to deal with that. However, if you're kind enough to shell the sunflower seeds for them, um, the sort of the hearts are sort of relatively small um, and um, very sort of new, uh, sort of energy rich, then they will take those in preference um, if they're presented in a nice feeder to the sort of the smaller, um, uh, the smaller Niger seeds. So I think it's sort of an evolution of what we've been doing as much as the sort of the, um, the birds themselves. And of course, you've also got to remember, um, it's not just you that's putting out birds, but also your neighbors are putting out some food. And uh, we, we, are, we are starting to get one or two reports of sort of um, um, bird feeding wars, if you like, where people are sort of trying to um, um, up their bird feeding game to um, uh, steal birds from their neighbours, if you like. Um, so it's um, there's lots of skullduggery in the suburbs um, um, over this sort of thing. Oh, that sounds like a completely separate interview. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant yeah, answer, by the way. I, I, I just this is see this is why you're a director of the BTO and I'm not, because that was a brilliant answer, and I wish I'd thought of it. In all the debates I've had, and I had, I mean, I'm, we're, not, we're not talking of hundreds, but quite a few. Um, in all those debates, why I couldn't come up with the answer you've just come up with, well, I don't know, but as I say, that's why you're a director of the BTO and I'm not. So that's a brilliant answer. Thanks for that, Rob. Um, so the last bird that we're going to talk about is the Cataligra, a relatively sort of new bird to the country, but doing staggeringly well. So again, is this is this being driven by climate change? Because this is a bird that you would normally associate with the likes of south of France and you know all around the Mediterranean uh, Mediterranean and now you know it's, it's very much becoming almost a common bird certainly within England so is it climate change that's driving that? I think certainly climate change is a large part um, of the story of um, both the cattle egret but also the little egret uh, which is now um, as you say across much of England is now a sort of a bird that you almost don't uh, don't notice, um, and it's not just it's not just the little egret. It's all of the herons are doing um, really well. So spoonbills, um, I saw three spoonbills um, in Holcombe um, just at the weekend. Um, great white egrets, again, they're a bird, a bird that um, people are increasingly coming across in southern Britain in winter, and the, the first pairs have started tentatively um, to breed in Britain. And part of that. Um, is uh, we think it's down to climate, so the uh, the warmer winters, but I think also um, it's down to water quality. So um, there has been a lot of um, a lot of progress in terms of cleaning up our rivers, um, in terms of sort of nitrate runoff, um, phosphate runoff. So actually, our rivers and lakes um, do have more fish in them than perhaps they would have done um, 20 or 30 years ago so that the birds are able to um, find food. Um, and again, we have to sort of um, recognize the brilliant work that the RSPB is doing here 
um, around some of it creating uh, creating wetland reserves. So um, Lake and Heath particularly, but um, also other parts around the country. Um, I think those provide the the nucleus for um, birds to uh, the, the population to start, and that pr provide the foothold from which they can then um, spread. Right. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. I, I mean, sp you mentioned spoonbills. Um, spoonbills would have been again for well for anybody in the country, you know, red letter bird. Uh, but I remember sort of you know because I lived in the northeast uh, northwest for a long time. But I also lived in sort of the middle of the country and, and Fairburn in Leeds was my local patch. And after I moved down to Norfolk, Spoonbill started breeding at Fairburn, which I wasn't overly impressed about because I, I was coming down here for the birds and they were all going up there. So that's not allowed to happen anymore. So just on, on an end point, and um, this is just a question that I haven't prepped you in any way for whatsoever. Um, just a bit of fun really if you were to predict and not counting any of the herons right so you're not allowed to count the herons because you think they are finding their way over but if you were to predict what the next bird outside of the heron family would be to follow the path of the little egret and sort of come over here and then almost explode what would you think that's a that's a really tough question. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer. People people have tried this and failed. Um, so lots of people thought that um, maybe Savvy's warbler, um, for instance, or another bird that breeds um, breeds on the continent, um, breeds occasionally in Britain. Um, might expand, um, but it doesn't really seem to have uh, done so. Um, the one I, I don't know whether I have a realistic expectation of, um, of it reading here, but the one I, that I might quite like to see um, is a yellow-browed warbler. A um, right, number yeah. that um, come here in winter has increased enormously over the last 10 to 15 years. So um, it's becoming almost a regular um, wintering bird now in Britain. And I'd like to think that some of those stay and uh, one day it might actually become um, a, a member of our um, breeding, uh, a breeding community too. But that's maybe, it's maybe not the next one, but um, who knows, maybe, maybe in um, 15 or 20 years time. Well, thanks for taking a stab at it, because I say, I didn't, I'd, I'd not even hinted that I was going to ask you that question, but it just, I, I get asked it, because when I work at Pencil, I get asked that, you know, a few times, will we ever see redback shrike back here, you know, in numbers breeding? Um, and you know, glossy ibis and various things like that. Um, so it's, it's quite an interesting debate, especially with global warming. So, but thanks, because I would not, if I'd have written down some birds beforehand, neither of those birds would be on it. That, yeah, I thought you were saying, but yellow-browed warble would be a really good one and I'd drink to that because they're a fantastic little bird. Mm. Great. Well, that strikes an interesting one actually, in the sense that, we do. Um, it is a common migrant, so birds do come across um, do come across from Sweden, and people have sort of talked about the um, the shrike um, sort of re-establishing again from sort of from from, um, from sort of Scandinavia. But I think the changes that we've seen in our landscape are just too great. These but these are birds that are feeding on large insects, grasshoppers, crickets, um, and those just just aren't there in the landscape anymore. So until we get that right, however warm the climate gets. I think um, I think sadly the uh, the redback shrike is going to be a bird of history. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a bird I would like to be able to look out the window and see, and it's not a wader. You'd be surprised to hear, um, but it has weird traits, as in its beak makes it look like a bit like a wader. Is the hoopoe? I'd love to see hoopoes flying around on a regular basis because I grew up with them in South Africa and I love them. They're an amazing bird, but um, I'm not holding my breath. 
yeah and sadly i think the same the same thing the same thing applies that um we need the habitat there for it certainly certainly the climates are warming so we should we should expect to see them um um becoming more frequent as a sort of a visitor but whether they they stop to breed is um, a different matter altogether excellent well rob that was really insightful it was it, we we could literally go on for hours about the bird trends report because there's so much in it um but we'll allow people to go on and actually find it on the website and you know do their own investigation but so for now that that was really good so thank you ever so much for your time and i hope to speak to you again in the not too distant future even if it's just to discuss music so take care rob cheers and you thanks a lot bye